Church. Uh, before we get started, um, Joni wants to say a few words, but you know what? We want the, the crowd to see you on, on the online, so you got to come up here, Joni, okay? Come up. And, and I will even help you up on the stage. She has a few words she'd like to share with everybody. Here you go. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to thank everyone so much for all the support and the love and the fellowship that I've received since I've been here a little over a year ago. So I'm going to miss you all terribly. I wish I could take you with me, but uh, I need to go back home. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joni. Um, Joni and her husband, uh, Jay, were an integrate part of this church, and uh, we just want to... Thank you so much for blessing our lives, and I hope we were a blessing to you also. Thank you, Joni. Um, while we're at it, uh, Joni's going to be moving next week, um, and uh, she's going to need some help loading the trailer. So if any of you have time or are available, like to join us, we're going we're to help her and, and pack. So get a hold of Pastor or myself, and we'll let you know when that's going to be and, and where she lives, okay? After Okay, after church or lunch on Sunday. Next Sunday? Okay, good. We'll do that. Okay, so anybody interested, let us know, okay? We'll, show you, we'll tell you where she lives. Um, Saturday morning uh, men's gathering. Uh, Tom Geiger has started a men's uh, get-together Bible study on Saturday morning, and we've been doing it for a couple of weeks now, or for a few weeks, about a month we've been doing it. But uh, we're going to do uh, another one this uh, Next week, next Saturday morning here, and we want to invite all you men who are, who are open on Saturday and not do anything to come down. Uh, God has laid upon Tom's heart to do a lot of improvements around here. So yesterday we had an opportunity not only to do Bible study but, uh, uh, and have uh, burritos for breakfast, but we, we also started doing some major cleanups around the, around the church and stuff, which is really important. Because when people, Tom mentioned it to me, when people come to our church, we want them to see and be, pl be pleasing in their sight when they see 
the grounds and that, that they are beautiful and that God is glorified through all of that. So come and be a part of that. And we're going to continue to clean up and just make this church a be- not only a beautiful church to be a part of, but a beautiful church to come to. So um, that's next Saturday. Uh, prayer requests, giving cards. Oh, Tom, let's say something. Eight o'clock. I'm sorry. I should have said that. Eight o'clock next Saturday morning. Come be a part of that and join us. Um, in the pews in front of you, you'll see that there's prayer request cards. There's giving cards, uh, envelopes. There's uh, uh, um, new new people uh, cards in there. Uh, feel free to grab one of those, look at them, and uh, if you decided that you want to fill one of those out, go ahead and do that. We want to encourage you to do that. Uh, the prayer request cards, if you want... To, for us to pray for somebody that you know of that's going through a rough or difficult times, put that down on one of the cards. Uh, and when you leave today, drop the offering envelopes, any cards that you have in the treasure chest on the backs of the sanctuary as you leave today. Uh, Sunday morning prayer, prayer uh, meeting is on the very back room. As you walk through the front door, you go to the very far left and the far right door back there. And that's at 9 a.m. every Sunday morning. So before church, uh, Tom also runs that, and he uh, would like to encourage you to be a part of that uh, and come be a part of that ministry. It's, it's wonderful. It's a prayer ministry, and that's what they do. They pray for the needs of our church, so be a part of that. Wednesday night, uh, Bible study and fellowship uh, starts at 6 p.m. We have a fel- uh, fellowship, and we'll feed you, so don't cook dinner on Wednesday night. Come and be a part of that, uh, and then we get into the study about 6.30, 6.45, and we try to we're, we're very respectful of your time, so we try to get out of here by 8 anyway. And that's on uh, Wednesday night. Birthdays this week. Donna Santa Maria. Her birthday is on the 27th. Now, usually Donna's here by now, but I'm sure she'll be walking in the door anytime. But uh, also, anniversaries this week. We have Dwayne and Sarah Hubbard. Yay! And their anniversary is on the 27th. So uh, tell her happy anniversary when you see her. Well, um, <laughs> also, uh, um, I want you to continue to perfectly consider the financial support to this ministry here at uh, Pace and Family Church. It's important because everything that, that you give uh, into, goes to God's glory, first and foremost. And uh, we use it for his glory. None of it comes to us. It's all for, for the, the church and what we stand for and reaching people that are lost for Christ. Amen. And John, well, thank you for oh, one more. Tom, uh, we don't have it on our list yet, probably, but Steve had a birthday on the 18th. On the 18th, oh, uh, so we need to. Oh, happy birthday, Steve! Yeah, Steve's birthday. Okay, anything else? I, that's all I got. That's it. All right, let's all stand and greet one another. Welcome to Payson Family Church. Yep, again, almost the third time. <laughs> Not quite. Good morning. How are you? I like it. That is really pretty. That is pretty. Did you make that? Oh, that is really pretty. have to come in on a practice night or something. And Good job. I'm going to give the message.
Let's sing it together. You are God alone. You are not a God. Let's sing. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything we can give by a man. That's just the way you are. Right, let's sing it again. provided for us. He guides and directs us. He, he fulfills his purpose in our lives as we yield to him. This next song just kind of speaks of that. All right, let's sing it together. He lowers us to raise us. He lowers us to raise us. So we can sing his praises, whatever is his way, all is well. He makes us rich and poor, that we might trust him more. Oh my 
it's a uh, wonderful thing to be in the hands of the Most High God, especially when he's your Lord and your Savior. And if you don't know him, it is a fearful thing to be in his hands because he is just and he is righteous. And he loves us. This next song is a new song to us. Um, we've been learning it for a while. We thought we would just uh, let you learn it with us now from here on out. So uh, we've been playing it on the countdown videos in the mornings for a couple of months. And it's called Highlands, Song of the Saint.
Good morning, church. Thanks for being with us this morning. This is our second week of guest speakers. We'll be back to regular service next week, live, in person. Like it or not, you, you get me next week. So enjoy this week. Uh, if you haven't spent any time understanding that song, for those of you that maybe heard it for the first time, I would urge you to get into the book of Psalms. Start with 120 and go through uh, 134. That's what cons is considered the Songs of Ascent. It has a lot to do with the pilgrimages of the Jews for the three festivals going up to Jerusalem to spend time worshiping, praising, and, and honoring God. Great song. Thanks for uh, enjoying it with us as we introduce it into our, our rotation here. So this morning, if you get your Bibles out, last week we talked about heaven. And if you weren't here, go ahead and get on Facebook. It'll be in our, our library on Facebook. This week, we're going to talk about hell. And hopefully you learned something. Hopefully it inspires you. Hopefully it challenges you. Let's go ahead and uh, spend a moment with the Lord before we get started. God, we thank you for the natural desire of our hearts, our minds, our spirits, now that we're your children, to be in your presence. Now that we have filled the God-shaped void in our lives with the presence of the one true God. Thank you that you are continuing to draw us to you, and it is our desire to be there. God, let today be another time of challenge, understanding, growth, and uh, true biblical enlightenment. God, I ask that you be with those who couldn't be here today. Bring healing to hearts and minds and spirits. Thank you for your blessings poured out upon your children. God, let them flow through all of us to a world that needs to know your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Do we not have class today? She's not here. Did anybody send a child to class Maybe I don't think anybody's there. Anybody want to go to kids' class? Oh, this is better. This is better. Do you want to? Do you want to do a craft, um, sweetie? If you have candy, now all the grown-ups are going to show up. <laughs> How do you? You know what? You cannot beat that. Um, I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead, uh, Jesse, and get started with this, this morning's sermon. There is no God. I mean, look at what's going on. In I am my own God. God, Allah, Buddha. 
whatever. He's just waiting to destroy us all. There's like hundreds of gods. It's and just like that book I am my own says, god. Dog is my co-pilot. There is no god. There is one true god. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he loves you. Good morning. I'm going to miss hearing that every week, and he loves you. I love that we start every message on this series with that last little bit, and he loves you. And he does. And uh, what a joy this has been for me to go through uh, this series on doctrine, on truth. I love, love, love doing it. Um, unfortunately, we just barely skim a lot of these topics. You know, each one of these, uh, you could do a 10-part series in each of these topics. But um, uh, most people wouldn't want to hear a 10-week sermon or series on hell, which is a topic we're talking about today. But let's turn in our Bible, shall we, to the book of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. Turn to Matthew 25, but also, if you don't mind, place a marker or pre-turn and keep a finger there in Revelation 20 and in Luke chapter 16 while you're at it. So... Matthew 25, Revelation 20, and then Luke chapter 16. I'm going to venture a guess that most of you don't know the name Joe McCarthy, unless you are like avid baseball fans. Joe McCarthy was manager for the New York Yankees in the 1930s and 1940s. That's why most people wouldn't really understand who he was unless you were an avid baseball fan, because he is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But... Uh, Joe McCarthy, uh, on one occasion, said that he had a dream that he went to heaven. And in heaven, standing before him, were all the players, the baseball players, the greats of the past that he would have known. People like Ty Cobb, Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, all standing before him on a baseball team. He was so ecstatic. Yeah, it's like the dream team, right? So here he is in his dream in heaven, seeing this class of greats on a team, and he gets a phone call from hell, from the devil. And it's the devil challenging that team in heaven to a baseball game. And Coach Joe said, you haven't got a chance. I've got all the great players. And the devil said, yes, but I have all the umpires. Let me be honest with you. I, I have not looked forward to preaching this message. It's not a message I enjoy preaching. Um, it is a message that most people don't like to hear. In fact, of all the sermons we've done in this series, in the 2020 series, uh, this is going to be the hardest. Uh, it, it should be the hardest. It should make everyone feel uncomfortable because no one likes to even think of hell. Um, it is considered an offensive topic. I don't want you to be offended, but you do need to hear the truth. And some of you do need to be warned very, very stringently about it. You know, I've noticed that most people in general don't want to talk about eternal things. I mean, you can talk about anything, but if you, if you get to the deep stuff, especially where are you going to spend forever, most people don't want to have that conversation. And if they really do want to have the conversation, it's an indication they're about to be saved. Now, there's a reason they want to go there. But most people want to avoid especially the idea of hell, and I've noticed a lot of preachers uh, don't like to talk about hell. Now, I say that, but at the same time, I've noticed that a lot of people will use the term hell a lot in their daily conversation. They use it sort of as a fill word, right, or, or an expletive. They'll say things like, what in the hell are you doing? Um, and there's no need to put that word in there. You could just say, what are you doing? But it's like a fill word. Um, I'm madder than hell. Or I've heard people say, my feet hurt like hell. I, I seriously doubt that. <laughs> or that scared the hell out of me. Now, that's a good thing. If that happens, I'm glad that happens. 
I even had a man walk up to me on a Sunday after a sermon, no joke, put his arm on my shoulder. He was so excited about the message. He goes, that was a hell of a sermon, Pastor. I did not know how to respond to him. Didn't know if I should say thank you or just let it go. Um, also, one time, I, I think it was the first time I was in Israel when I first went there to live. Um, it was the first time I had Turkish coffee. So Turkish coffee is a coffee they have in Israel. They call it cafe bots, which means mud. If it gives you an ind indication of strength. So it's Turkish coffee, very strong. And the guy serving me the coffee said, would you like hell? I said, no, I don't want hell. <laughs> what he was talking about is there is a spice that in Hebrew is chel. And chel is cardamom, and it's really good in Turkish coffee. So coffee with hell is really good in that circumstance. It's probably the only circumstance. I was thinking of all sorts of titles to call this message, clever titles. I thought I'll call it What's Down with Hell? Or I thought maybe I'll, I'll call it Highway to Hell, like the ACDC song. Or I even thought I'd call it Smoking or Non-Smoking. <laughs> but the more I thought about the title, I thought this subject is way too serious uh, to just give it a tacky or kitschy or cute little clever title. So I'm just calling this message The Truth About Hell. Because if there's one thing you don't want to get wrong, it's this. A survey that I came across, a, a Pew Forum survey, indicates that 87% of Americans believe in God. It's pretty high. It goes down a little bit after that, though. 74% of Americans say they believe in heaven, and only 59% say they believe in hell. Now, why that really interests me is because all of those topics have the same source material. When it comes to God or heaven or hell, it's all come from this book. So you got a lot of people believing in God, few less believing in heaven, but a whole lot less believing in hell. Uh, Rob Bell, who is a name some of you may be familiar with, he was sort of a rock star in evangelical circles years ago, a young upstart pastor in Michigan, uh, wrote uh, books that got a lot of uh, airplay. Velvet Elvis is one of them, I think his first book. Another book, Love Wins. He has, since his start, taken a very liberal approach to truth uh, as, so as to deny even biblical truth. But he was asked in an interview a very simple and forthright question. Is there a hell? Here's his answer. I actually think there is a hell because we see hell every day. He described hell as greed, injustice, rape, abuse. We see hell on earth all around us all the time. We actually see lots of people choosing hell. We see oppression. We see tyranny. We see dictators using their power to eliminate opposition, literally. In other words, Rob Bell is saying, yeah, there's a hell, but not an eternal hell. There's just hell on earth. It's when bad people do bad things to hurt a whole lot of people. That's hell. What you need to know is the Bible does not describe hell that way, but it's something far worse than hell on earth. You also need to know that your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, absolutely believed in hell, and he spoke on it a lot. And one of the places that he spoke on it is Matthew 25. I'm going to begin reading in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If you would go down to verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil 
and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Now, let me just kind of tell you uh, some preliminary stuff. Some people see what I just read as an event called the judgment of the nations. Um, eschatologically, they see this as an event taking place in the future where God judges nations uh, after the tribulation period based on how they treated the nation of Israel during the tribulation period to determine their admission into the kingdom age or not. That's one way to interpret it. Other people see this as a general description of judgment for all saved and all unsaved. I am not here to unravel that. I just want, really want to focus on this topic, so I just wanted to get that out there. I really want to focus on verse 41, where it says, He will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil, and his angels. Now, the illustration that our Lord uses is an illustration they would have understood of a shepherd separating sheep and goats. In the Middle East, even to this very day, you can see this happening. You will see shepherds on hillsides. They have a flock that is mixed, some sheep and some goats, but they're walking together. But then the shepherd will separate the sheep from the goats at two very important times during the day, grazing time and sleeping time. And that is because sheep and goats have very different temperaments. Sheep are docile, sometimes clueless. They just sort of kind of meander around, wander around. Goats are, are sort of impervious to things. They're aggressive. Um, uh, they're rambunctious. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll charge things that sheep would not do that. So when it comes to feeding, it's not good to keep them together when they eat. It's not good to keep them together when they rest. They don't rest well together. So the shepherd will separate the sheep from the goats. That's the background of this. What I'd like to do is kind of zeroing in on these verses, but mostly verse 41. I want to share five facts about hell. And the first is that hell is an actual place. It's an actual place. You see, Jesus in this section is speaking of an actual event that will take place in the future. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Now, here's a simple question. Is Jesus going to come? Literally? Yes, he is. He said that on a number of occasions. So did all the apostles. So we're dealing with a literal event in the future. And then in that same context, he speaks about eternal punishment and eternal kingdom. Now, if you were to do a quick search of the word hell in an English Bible, like the New King James Version that I speak from, you'd find that the word hell in English shows up 32 times in the Bible, 32 times. But all of the references about hell throughout the Bible total 162 times. And sometimes they're just sort of plain, in your face, up front, like Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned to hell, and the nations, all the nations that forget God. It's pretty straight up. Or Daniel chapter 12, where Daniel predicts a time that is coming, the worst time ever in history, called the tribulation period. And afterwards, he writes, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. But by far, the majority of all the biblical teaching we have on hell comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. More than anybody else, Jesus spoke on hell. 
In fact, Jesus spoke on hell more than Jesus spoke on heaven. It is estimated, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the times he refers to it, 70 times. 70 times Jesus spoke about or referred to hell. And in, in the kind of language that nobody can, like, yawn at, you can't go, yeah, whatever. It's, it's the kind of language that strikes terror, or it, it should, into every heart. He spoke about hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. He spoke of hell as a place where the fire is not quenched. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke of hell as a place where the worm never dies. He spoke of it as outer, outer darkness, uh, a place where one is tormented by flames and past memories. And he spoke of it as a place where there's a great gulf that is fixed between hell and paradise. Jesus, in Matthew 10, verse 28, said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is Jesus, man of love. Now, here's my question. If we cease to exist after we die, that's it. We just live and we die and we cease to exist. Then why did he spend so much time warning people about hell? And, and, and if you think, well, that's not very loving, I contend it's the most loving thing you can do. If you know there's a hell and you don't warn people of it, that's not loving. If there is a hell and you warn people of it, that's loving. And he warned people a lot of it. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Problem of Pain, these words, There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this, if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom, and it has the support of reason. End quote. See, if there is no hell then the Bible's a book of myths. If there is no hell, then Jesus was just a misguided soul. If there is no hell, then the crucifixion was pointless. There's no significance in dying to save us from what? If there's no hell, then you should sin as much as you possibly can. Because it's not sin, it's just fun. Right? It's just all about you getting pleasure in this life, sucking it like an orange dry at every drop of enjoyment you can. But if there are consequences for deeds and beliefs, then we should receive the warning. Hell is an actual place. And there are several words the New Testament uses to describe it. One is the word Hades. Uh, Hades, the Greek word Hades, is... Uh, the equivalent of an Old Testament Hebrew word, Sheol, which simply means the grave. It is spoken about a couple of different ways. Sometimes it refers to the, just the grave in the ground where bodies are buried. Uh, sometimes it refers to life after the grave, the soul's existence after death. That's one word, Hades. Another word is the word Gehenna. It is used 12 times mostly by the Lord Jesus. Did you know that Gehenna originally referred to a valley outside of Jerusalem? The southwest corner of Jerusalem has a valley to this day, a ravine called Gehinnom, the valley of the son of Hinnom. And in ancient days, it was a garbage dump. You threw your garbage, there was always a fire going on, bodies of criminals were, in car, uh, were, were placed there and burned up there, bodies of animals uh, taken from the city that died so the city wouldn't be defiled, thrown into hell, Gehenna. In the 8th century B.C., it was the place where um, under King Ahaz and King Manasseh, people offered their children as sacrifices to pagan gods. And because of that detestable, horrible, smelly, burning place, it became a metaphor for an eternal place of punishment, hell. A third word that is used is the word Tartarus. It's only used once in the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2. 
as a place for bound, fallen angels awaiting final judgment. The fourth term is the lake of fire. It's Revelation 19 and 20. The lake of fire is name of a place of eternal torment. You, you might call it the final hell. The Bible calls it the second death. So, so hell is an actual place. There's a second fact I want you to notice, and that is hell is an intentional place. What I mean by that is God created hell for a very specific reason. Verse 41, he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire, here it is, prepared for the devil and his angels. God did not create hell as a place to punish people originally. It became that eventually, but it was not created that way originally. And notice the word prepared for the devil and his angels. Compare that with verse 34. The king will say to those on the right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. That's what God prepared for people. Heaven. Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to prepare a place for you. So heaven is prepared for people. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. However, there's something about God you need to know. God is pro-choice when it comes to salvation. When it comes to salvation, God lets people choose where they want to go. And if they don't want anything to do with God, I want nothing to do with God. God's not going to force you to be in heaven where he is all the time. He'll let you and respect your choice. G.K. Chesterton wrote, Hell is God's great compliment to the reality of human freedom and the dignity of human choice. A person went up to God and said, God, would you send me to hell and lock me in forever? And God said, no, I will not send you there. But if you choose to go there, I could never lock you out. So it is an intentional place, originally created for the devil and his angels. But here, even in our text, there are some people that, that Jesus, that judgment says, you're going there. So I, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. It's a book we've been looking at the last few weeks. And there's an unmistakable future event that you need to see, a couple of them. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Here's a really good part. I love this verse. The devil, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Can I get a hallelujah on that verse? It's like, yeah, finally he gets what's coming to him. So that's what Jesus meant when he said it's prepared for the devil and his angels. Foom, that's where they go. No matter what Hollywood says, Satan does not rule hell. And that's the idea that they always portray. Here's the devil, and he's like the chief tormentor of hell. No, he is not. He is the chief victim of hell. He gets thrown in there, and he is tormented day and night. But it doesn't end there, unfortunately. Verse 11 continues and says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 14, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is called the great white throne judgment. It is the judgment by God of all 
unbelievers. All unbelievers. It is a courtroom scene, but it's very different than an earthly court because here in Revelation 20, there's no debate about guilt. There is a prosecution, but no defense. There will be a judge, but no jury. There will be a sentence, but no appeal. And there is a punishment, but no parole. And something you need to know, it will be fair. It will be fair. I know it will be fair because verse 12 says books were opened. So the idea behind that is a full inventory of a person's life is kept. Books were open. Now, I don't know exactly what's in the books. Perhaps a record of every thought, every word, every deed. Jesus did say, if you remember, that every idle word men speak, they will give an account for in the day of judgment. Another book may be a record of all the times that person had an opportunity to give their life to Christ. Every time they heard the gospel but refused. Remember that time your mom told you this? Remember the time you heard that in church? Remember that, that opportunity? And that, and that all is recorded, perhaps. One thing for sure, there's, there's only one person behind the bench. This is not a committee. He isn't voted in or out. There's only one person who is the judge, one person presiding over this judgment, and it's the only one qualified to preside over this judgment. He is qualified because he alone has certain attributes that nobody else has, attributes we have covered in this series on doctrine. One of the attributes is the attribute of omniscience. God knows everything. That means he knows every thought, every action, every motive of every single person. Also, he has the attribute of omnipresence. He's everywhere present in the totality of his being, which means God alone is the best eyewitness of every single event in history. So he will be the judge. Buddha will not be the judge. Krishna will not be the judge. Muhammad will not be the judge. God alone is the judge. So hell is an actual place it is an intentional place. There's a third fact, and it gets worse before it gets better. Hell is a painful place. Back to our text in, in Matthew 25, you'll notice in verse 31 the word fire, 41, the word fire, everlasting fire. You'll also notice in verse 46 the word punishment. You have a couple descriptive words that talk about what that experience will be like. Fire doesn't sound fun. Punishment doesn't sound fun. Sounds painful to me. Do you know that I've had people laugh at me when I bring up the idea of hell, especially in relationship to them? They're, oh, hell. I'm looking forward to hell. I've had people tell me that. I'm looking forward to hell. Well, why is that, sir? Because all my friends are going to be in hell. Okay, you need new friends, but... It's no good reason for you to go. And now you go, no, no, all my friends are going to be in hell, and we're going to party. You've ever heard that? That's where all the fun is, hell. Dumb, bad, bad idea. Scrap that idea. Revelation 14 describes it as they will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured out full strength into the cup of his wrath. And it says, they will be tormented, and there is no rest day or night. Does that sound like a party to you? Does that sound like a party you want to go to? No. Did you know that seven times when Jesus Christ spoke of hell, he spoke of it this way, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or sometimes there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Anybody ever hit their thumb with a hammer? like I have. Okay, so really, you guys need to get hammers out and actually use them sometime then. Um, so I've done that. And, and when I do that, I have a physical reaction. I usually, um, 
I don't cuss, but I, uh, I will um, squeeze my eyes shut and I will gnash with my teeth. My teeth will grind and because that's it's painful. It's my reaction to pain, weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's something about that gnashing of teeth. It could refer to a person's anger. It could even refer to the idea of gnashing of the teeth of a person with a, a fist up to God, still angry at him. Because in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen shared the truth of the gospel, it says, and the people that heard him were cut to the heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. It's like, they're so mad at this believer for telling them the truth of the gospel. So it could be in hell, the idea of the gnashing of teeth is an anger, a hatred, a refusal to repent forever. So it's a painful place. Now, I'd like you to turn. Um, I had you uh, mark out Luke chapter 16. I think I told you that. Did I, did I not? Okay, good. I, I get my services mixed up, to be honest with you. I don't know if I said Luke 16, this one, or, or last one, but Luke 16. So in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story of the rich man and Lazarus. It is not a parable. Some people call it the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a story, not a parable. And you can usually tell a parable. Here's the telltale sign of a parable. Jesus spoke a parable unto them and said... So it introduces it by saying it's a parable. Or he will say the kingdom of heaven is like, so he's using that as an analogy. But this is no parable. It's a story. He probably knew about this event. In verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades... He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. That is not a party I want to be a part of. Among other things, this story shows us that at the moment of death, person is conscious, is aware, awake, um, can feel, can somehow communicate, and in this case, have immediate torment. And the pain uh, can't just be confined to physical pain. It has to be also the pain of shame, the pain of failure, the pain of regret, the pain of remorse, because there's no second chance. So hell is an actual place, an intentional place. Hell is a painful place. It keeps getting worse. It'll get better, but it gets worse. Hell is an eternal place. This is where it gets sticky with some people. And I'll share, I'll share that in a minute. But look at verse 41. It says, He will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the... What's the word? Everlasting fire. Now, what does everlasting mean? I mean, it lasts ever, forever. It is everlasting. And then verse 46, And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Everlasting means it keeps going and going and going. It's perpetual. Now, this is, as I mentioned, the real sticky part about hell, because somebody will, will hear this, and I've heard this, Many times people say, well, wait a minute, when is enough enough? When is enough punishment enough? I mean, if sins are committed in a finite realm, how can the punishment be infinite? Keep going and going and going and going. The only reason we would ask that is because we do not understand how offensive sin is to a perfectly holy God. 
See, we can't figure that out. I don't, what, why is that? It's not that bad to you, but to a holy God, that is so utterly offensive. And if you want to know about what sin can do, forget judgment for a minute. Forget hell for a minute. Look at the cross. That's what sin did. This, that's what God thought about sin. It's so bad that his son got that kind of punishment on a cross, darkness and pain and being cut off from the Father. So because it is hard to understand and come to grips with the eternality of hell, people have come up with all sorts of other beliefs to make it better. Let me, let me tell you about a few of them. One is called universalism. Universalism is the belief that nobody goes to hell, everybody goes to heaven. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you believe in. Everybody will eventually go to heaven. That's called universalism. Nobody's lost, everybody's saved. I'd love to believe that. And I, I would believe that if I didn't have this book that tells me otherwise. But universalism is everybody goes to heaven. Nobody goes to hell. And they base that on John chapter 12, verse 32, where Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. All men, all men, all men, all men and women, everybody. I'll draw all men to myself. If I die on a cross, I'll draw everybody to myself. Well, I have a couple problems with that. Problem number one is named Adolf Hitler. You mean to tell me that Adolf Hitler gets to go to heaven and I got to look at his mug in heaven and God's sitting there going, yeah, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes, but we're all here. I have a problem with justice not being meted out. I have a problem with Joseph Stalin being in heaven. I have a problem with Paul Pot being in heaven. Now, if they receive Christ, that's a different issue. But last time I checked, that didn't happen. When Jesus said, I'll draw all men to myself, he is not guaranteeing salvation. He is simply guaranteeing the availability of salvation to all. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But guess what? A lot of people perish, and they don't come to repentance. They don't make that choice. That's one, universalism. Here's another way that people deal with this, and that is called annihilationism. Annihilationism, also called conditional immortality, simply means that only the righteous will be resurrected. The wicked will just be annihilated. They will cease to exist. They won't have eternal consciousness. They'll just be put out as though they never existed in the first place. Seventh-day Adventists believe in that. Um, Jehovah Witnesses believe in that. It is a cultic belief. It is not a New Testament belief. Unfortunately, now some so-called evangelicals say they believe in that. Annihilationism. Another way of dealing with this is called purgation or purgatory. It is a Catholic doctrine that came to the Catholic Church in recent times, um, in the 16th century. In terms of world history, that's still recent. Uh, it was at the Council of Trent. Um, it does not come from the Bible. Even a Catholic, the Catholic theologians will tell you they can't find this in our Bible. So they resort to a book called 2 Maccabees chapter 12, which they have included in their canon of Scripture. Um, uh, to, there's one kind of offside reference that could mean... Anyway, they get purgatory from that idea. The idea is that God will forgive confessed sins... But unconfessed sins, you got to burn those off in purgatory. And it could take decades, it could take hundreds of years that you will suffer flame and pain. And then you get purified and you get your ticket and you go to heaven. Okay, all that aside, let's just cut to the chase. Verse 46, notice this. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. The word everlasting is the word in Greek, ionios. Anybody who knows Greek will tell you that means forever and ever and ever, age upon age, perpetual, never stopping, ionios. These will go away into everlasting punishment. Now, keep reading. But the righteous into what? 
eternal life. Same exact word, Ionios. Ionios punishment, Ionios life. What that tells us is this. If hell is not eternal, then heaven is not eternal. If heaven is eternal, then hell is also eternal. From the same verse. Now, one author I read even suggests that unbelievers in hell will perhaps go on sinning perpetually and also receiving punishment for their sin as they do that, but never repent. And they take this from Revelation 22, 11. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. Let him who is holy continue to be holy. I don't know, but I do know hell is an eternal place. But, but, the best news of all is the last fact. Hell is an avoidable place. You don't have to go there. I don't want you to sit here and go, man, hell. I guess that's where I'm going. Well, you don't have to go there. Don't go there. I hope most of you aren't saying that. Um, it's an avoidable place. The context of chapter 25 is about choices that people make. Here you have a shepherd who is separating sheep from goats based upon choices that the sheep and goats have made. The sheep have chosen to do certain things. The goats have cho chosen not to do certain things. And it says, I was in prison, I was hungry, and he lists all of these good deeds. Um, don't get confused. The good works mentioned here don't save anybody. They just provide evidence that a person has been saved. Uh, this is a separation. This is a courtroom. The good works are the proof that salvation has occurred. I, I want you to really get that drilled down. Look at verse 34. The king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. And then what's the next word? Inherit. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Did you know inherit is a family term? An inheritance is a gift. You don't earn it. It's given to you. Your, your dad or your grandparents give you an inheritance. They pass it on. They've worked for money or land, but they give it to you free to the next generation. So that's how salvation works. You don't earn eternal life. You inherit eternal life. As a family member, you say, well, how, how, how do I get into the family? Well, that's the catch. To get into this family, you have to be born into it. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. He spoke about a second birth. You were born once, but when you believe in Christ, when you commit your life to him, when you let him take your sin for you, and you believe in that as an efficacious event once and for all, you're born again and born into the family of God. Listen, there's only one person that wants you in hell. It's not Jesus. It is Satan. And he's been wanting, it's been his lifelong goal to put you in hell. That, I think you know that, right? That's his goal for every person that's ever lived is to fill up hell as much as possible. It's called collateral damage in a battle to get as many people to... Misery loves company. Get as many people as he possibly can with him. Jesus said, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I want to I want to conclude with a little excerpt. There's a, a great book that came out some years ago called Beyond Death's Door, written by a cardiologist. Uh, Dr. Morris Rawlings was a professor of medicine at University of Tennessee, cardiologist, heart surgeon, and an atheist. But he had several encounters with patients who died. He resuscitated them, and some told about heaven some told about hell. Now, you've heard about people who have had near-death experiences, and they've seen the bright light and angels and Jesus, right? You've heard that. Nobody writes about hell. Well, who would buy it? Right? That, those books don't sell. 
But do you know that those experiences actually exist? So Morris Rowlings, after looking at 300 patients who had these experiences, said in his book, I am thoroughly convinced there is life after death, and there are at least as many people going to hell as going to heaven. I'm convinced there's a hell and that we must conduct ourselves in such a way as to avoid being sent there at all costs. Duh. <laughs> well, here's the turning point for him. He said he was resuscitating a 48-year-old patient in his office who just dropped dead. Cardiac arrest. He was a mail carrier. And uh, he said when he came back to life, his patient had the worst expression on his face he had ever seen, ever. And uh, the patient said, I am in hell, he cried out. I am in hell. Here's what this good doctor wrote. Of course, that alone didn't change my thinking, but the fact that this 48-year-old was screaming, I am in hell, keep me out of hell, each time he responded to resuscitation efforts did cause me some concern. That's called understatement. And so he said, the patient who was being resuscitated asked the doctor, he said, pray for me. Now, here's what Dr. Rawlings said. He goes, not only am I an atheist, that guy was an atheist. And he said, pray for me. So he said, he prayed some fake prayer um, as an atheist to a God he didn't believe existed. But he said, after this was all over, I realized what really happened. It was a double conversion. Not only had this make-believe prayer converted this atheist mailman, it also converted this atheist doctor that was working on him. Dr. Rawlings became a believer. His son serves as an elder in a church today in Tennessee. You know, there, there's a formula I have shared with you over the years. It, it's good to bring it up right now as we close. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. That's the formula. If you're born once, you will die twice. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. If you're born once physically, you'll die physically and spiritually. But if you're born physically and born spiritually, born again, you'll only die once. And if the Lord comes back, you won't die at all. But even if you die, like Jesus said, whoever believes in me will live. Will live. I am the resurrection and the life. Great promise. Great promise. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for being so honest. Thank you for the Lord Jesus' upfront honesty about a place that he created that he prepared, just like the kingdom was prepared for us. There was a place prepared for those spirits uh, that rebelled. And yet you honor people's choices that we have day after week after month after decade to make. We all think about heaven and hell, death, all of us, all our lives at some point we think about that, we wonder about that. Most of us just sort of put it off and blow it off. But our Lord Jesus warned us enough that we should think about it very seriously. Because if there's something we need clarity on and we need truth about, it's the truth about what happens when we die. Thank you for him and for your word giving us that clarity. Lord Jesus, I know you love people. I know that you are eager to forgive. You are not willing that any should perish. So, Lord, if there are any here who are in the process of perishing by not believing, by putting you off, by blowing this off, they would stop right now, right here, and say yes to the Savior and allow them to come home to be part of your family and to be forgiven, to have their name written in the book of life by so doing that, by believing in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The uh, cross did not create a place for us to go, it created a way. 
It was God's original intention from well, the beginning of creation. The idea was already in place. I, I can't speak time ab about eternity. I don't know how to describe that. But it was God's intention from the moment he created man to, to spend time with us and, and sin got in the way. So when it was the right time, while we were still in sin, God sent his son Jesus to die for us. And it was not to create a place, but to create a way back to him. Today, when you take communion, remember that it was God's decision. It was Jesus. It was Jesus's bloodshed and body broken on our behalf. Go ahead and spend some time with him, with your heart right. To me, the word gratefulness beyond measure, those words just ring so loud when I think of communion, remembering what he did for us. Go ahead and take when you're ready, and I'll be back with you in a couple minutes, and we'll close out. Here's your challenge for the week. Every human being created. Because of sin is on a path to stay separated from God for eternity. But we serve a God whose desire is for them to make the right choice which is to choose Christ and not go to a place that was created for sinners but to go to a place that always has been and that's the presence of God the problem is so much of the world doesn't take that serious you and I both know it's not good works that get us to heaven, and it's not bad works that send us to hell. Being born is the path to living without God forever. So a world out there that thinks, I've lived a good life, I may be going to heaven, but a Christian knowing a good life has nothing to do with it, only accepting what Jesus did on your behalf has something to do with it, you and I have a job to do of sharing that truth. People are born on a path to eternal separation from God. Here's the question. You believe in hell. I believe in hell. As far as I know, everyone sitting here is not going to be there. But what are you going to do about those 
outside this building that may still be on that path. It's not, it's not an easy conversation, but it's eternal. This week, I would like to challenge you, go, go into that conversation with somebody. Don't, don't start it with the bad news of you're going to hell unless you change your mind. Maybe start it with the good news of you don't have to live without God. There's a way to be in his presence forever. But the truth matters to people's eternity. That's your challenge for this week. I'm going to dismiss you in just a second. Um, stay after if you would. Tom's going to lead us in some, some prayer time. We're going to pray over Joni. Um, very sad to see her go, but so excited for what God has. And we want to see God's hand on, on all of that. So as of this moment, you are officially dismissed. Stay after if you want to be a part of that prayer time with Tom. And uh, I love you. I will see you next week. Be safe, please. Enjoy the wind. Because apparently it's not going away. Although it does go away. <laughs> All right, I love you. You're dismissed.